Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Steve Sapiens with the Pulitzer Center. We'll get started here in a few moments with today's conversation with Mariana Palau, winner of the 2021 Breakthrough Award. As we uh, wait um, for more people to join us, um, please uh, let us know if you're if you're here already to in the chat. Let us know where you're uh, watching or listening in from. We'd love to see um, where you're joining us from. So um, just to give you a little bit of background on the Pulitzer Center, um, if you'd like to learn more about all the uh, incredible journalism and education work that we've helped support in the past year, um, I'd like to recommend that you check out our recently uh, released uh, annual report. Um, it has links to incredible reporting, terrific photography, and um, our amazing education programming. So you can take some time and explore it. Um, looks like we've got Carlos from Cali, Colombia. Um, looks like uh, John from Tucson, Arizona. Thank you for joining us. Hello, Peter, Peter DeCampo from Seattle. Hello, Peter. Joel Enriquez Sanchez from Mexico. I'm going to keep going with uh, the Pulitzer Center in collaboration with news outlets and journalists around the world. We're a nonprofit journalism and education organization with a mission to elevate public engagement um, with uh, global issues. Um, we're based in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, but really our, our staff and, and our work are, 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 are global. Um, between 2019 and 2021, we supported 332 grantees in 50, over 50 countries. Over 70% of the journalists we support are freelancers. Um, we certainly recognize that freelance journalism is an extremely difficult endeavor uh, with, with many hazards and stresses for the reporters to do it. Uh, we have a great appreciation for that. Um, and although um, our support cannot solve um, all the problems with the current journalism business models, we will continue to support freelancers and bolster responsible journalism and do everything we can to engage people um, across the political spectrum and all the divides of class, religion, and race. Um, as with uh, uh, today's event, we aim to create opportunities for learning and conversation um, through the reporting uh, that we, we fund um, throughout the year. Um, our hope is that uh, you will continue to join us for these talks, and please also consider becoming a Pulitzer Center champion to support our work. Um, just a few kind of basic logistics before we move on. Um, we are going to... Uh, start the conversation with our guests, uh, and then we'll allot some time for questions from the audience. Um, you'll see a Q&A icon on your screen, and you can begin adding your questions at any time uh, during the presentation, and, and, and um, we encourage you to do so. Um, there's also a chat icon. Um, we'd appreciate it if you use the chat box um, for specific uh, tech questions or tech issues that you might be experiencing. Um, and also note that um, all the attendees are muted, um, but if you can't hear us, definitely let us know in the chat box. We want to let you know that we are recording this session and we will post it online. And one other note, please stay with us a little bit longer after the session ends to participate in a brief uh, survey. So we've got a few more people joining from, uh, looks like Marcelo from Quito, Ecuador. Thank you for joining us. Um, so uh, now we're going to start the main program. Uh, we're here to honor the work of a very special Pulitzer grantee. She's the recipient of the 2021 Breakthrough Award. This award, now in its third year, seeks to recognize and celebrate the achievements of a Pulitzer-affiliated freelance journalist uh, who report on underreported issues uh, that affect us all. This award is made possible through the very generous support of Ava Lohr, and this year we'll be awarding $12,000 to the winner and $5,000 to the runner-up. So if you are a Pulitzer Center grantee and an early to mid-career freelance journalist, please consider applying for this as soon as possible. The deadline is March 1st, and we'll put the link to the award in the application in the chat. So now I'd like to introduce Mariana Palau, who was recognized with the Breakthrough Award uh, for her impressive investigative reporting on the false positive scandal that fell Columbia's military hero. Um, her 2020 Pulitzer Center 
supported project was published by Guardian Longreads, um, and it focused on a rarely mentioned issue uh, about Colombia's 52-year armed conflict, the extrajudicial extra killing by army soldiers of innocent civilians who were falsely labeled as guerrilla combatants. Mariana is a Colombian-American journalist based in Bogota. She has written for The Economist, and her work appears on Al Jazeera and America's Quarterly. From, uh, from Colombia, she has covered such topics as the 2018 congressional and presidential elections, as well as the Colombian government's strategies against cocaine production. And she joins us today from England. Welcome, Mariana. Hi, Steve. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. Um, I really encourage everyone to apply uh, for this award and for uh, the Pulitzer Center's grants because uh, they, uh, certainly for me, uh, were a career turning point uh, as a freelancer. Like without the Pulitzer Center's support, I don't think I could have ever become a, a successful freelancer. So. So yeah, so thank you to the Pulitzer Center and thank you everyone uh, for tuning in. Um, Steve, I'm just uh, gonna start talking a bit about uh, the, the story and you know, kind of how I've been linked with the, uh, with the Pulitzer Center. Um, so in 2018, um, you know, I had taken the decision the year before to go uh, freelance and I was in Colombia and uh, uh, what I had noticed together with uh, two colleagues was that, you know, the peace deal had been signed in 2016 and all the international publications had lost interest, right? They just left. They were there through the negotiations of the peace deal, but, you know, when they, after they signed the peace deal, all of them had left. And we felt like it was just wrong to leave Colombia at that moment because the most important part about the peace deal would come after the signing of the peace deal, right? Because it's the hardest part of this peace deal was implementing it. And we felt like no one was giving enough attention to this very crucial issue where, you know, are they, are they actually implementing this very ambitious peace deal or not? And so we put up this proposal and uh, fortunately we won, uh, which was great. And it is with that grant that I was able to do this story that Steve mentioned on uh, the false positives uh, scandal and practice in Colombia. And um, just to tell you how this story took me a year uh, to do, uh, to report, to write, you know, going back and forth, fact checkers, finding more uh, studies, investigating more, interviewing more. It took a year uh, to do, and I could have never afforded to do that were it not for this grant. Um, and so I'll just tell you why I chose uh, this theme, the false positives, uh, to kind of like drive this story. And it's because, as Steve said, it's, it's rarely reported on, right? So you mostly hear about the FARC in Colombia, and you mostly hear about how the guerrillas kidnap people, and there should be a lot of attention on that, but I felt like, you know, the Colombian conflict is much more complex than that, and when you've got different sides fighting, the probability that one side is the saint is null, you know, war is a very convoluted issue, and the probability that all of the actors in a war are going to be engaged in wrongdoing is really hard, is basically zero. So what I felt was like, it wasn't so much for me as like, I need to go after the government, I need to, it was just basically a commitment for me to tell a story that would make it clear how every single actor of this conflict was involved in it and there was also wrongdoing in it. And through that, just explain how convoluted and complex the Colombian conflict can be. Um, and then, you know, it just so happened to be that I told the story of how the Colombian government messed up a public policy that resulted in the extrajudicial killings of thousands of, of individuals. Um, so what I chose to do was tell this story um, about, and Holly is putting up, there you go, a, a picture of the FARC right there. That's the FARC 
right? And they demobilized, as everyone knows. And after they signed the peace deal, we've come to uh, implement this peace tribunal. And so what I did was look at the story, uh, look back at the story from this central character whose name is Mario Montoya, who is or was uh, the commander of the military in Colombia and probably the most celebrated uh, military hero in all of Colombia's history. Um, and I chose to tell the story about him because one, he's a very interesting individual, but he also, you know, oversaw like one of the most successful campaigns against the FARC. Like if it weren't for Mario Montoya, the FARC probably would have never sat down to negotiate with the government, a peace deal with the government. So Mario Montoya is key in Colombia. He was really hammered them down. He was key in driving them to the negotiating table. However, this success contrasts with the fact that it was during his uh, command or during his tenure as commander of the military that the world got to know about this embarrassing scandal in which the army uh, was involved. And so I'm not sure if you have read the article, have had the chance to read the article. It's it's fine if you haven't, but you know I'll tell you like a, a brief uh, summary of it. I tell the story of how of his career, of how he rose to such prominence, and I tell the story of his successes. Um, basically, comparing it also uh, with the fact that. Uh, there was this major stain in uh, his CV, so to say, uh, which is that, you know, like many, most of the brigades uh, in Colombia were involved in these extrajudicial killings. And just to give you like a quick overview as well of how the false positives happened, what, what there was a public policy that sought to push the army to win the war. And it was not well thought of because what it, what it prioritized was body count. And when you prioritize body count, you are going to have consequences such as these. So soldiers you know, were promised a series of rewards like time off, um, and and uh, a higher ranking, or, or they were promised uh, like, Sort of, sort of medals, so to say. And, but to do that, they had to show numbers. They had to show that they had actually killed uh, their enemies. And so what ended up happening is that many of them motivated by this and also pressured, because there was a lot of pressure within the army to be really hard on the enemy and to kill the enemy. So what they ended up doing was um, attracting uh, poor civilians from all parts of the country, uh, even Bogota, luring them into like remote areas of the country, killing them there, dressing them up in guerrilla fatigues, and then reporting them as enemies killed in combat, right? And so what I do is, again, I tell the story of Mario Montoya, how he rose to fame, how he rose to prominence, how he commanded this army to be really effective against the FARC. But then underneath, we have this issue, which is very worrying, which is the false positives practice. That is the scandal that felled this uh, military hero. That is what basically ended his career and what today has him in uh, this legal situation. If we can go uh, to the next picture as well, Holly, please. Um, that is Mario Montoya in the height of his career. That is when he led one of the most important military operations against uh, the FARC. It's called Operation Hake, and I talk about it in the article as well. You know, it was hailed as an incredible operation across the world because not a single bullet was fired and they managed to uh, rescue more than 10 hostages among them. Uh, this woman who, by the way, is also running for president right now, uh, whose name was Ingrid Betancourt. Um, but, you know, he was instrumental in that operation and designing that operation. And that was one of his successes. Unfortunately, soon after, 
uh, we saw the false positive scandal and that's what ended his career so abruptly. What's happening now after uh, the peace deal is that Mario Montoya is now uh, going through a judicial process in the peace tribunal. And it's very interesting to look at what is happening in the tribunal because it reflects kind of what is happening in Colombian society and how Colombians feel and are digesting the peace deal and its implementation. A lot of people feel that Mario Montoya is a hero because as I said, he was very instrumental in driving the FARC to the negotiating table. Um, and, you know, they feel really uh, insulted, so to say, that Mario Montoya is uh, going through this judicial process in a peace tribunal that is also uh, meant to uh, try FARC members. So they consider, you know, why are you, why is, the, why are these two, like, they don't understand this hero, these kidnappers, like what is going on here? And second, the fact that because of the rules of the peace tribunal, Mario Montoya might uh, end up going to prison or to some sort of restricted freedom condition and the FARC leaders will not, that, that situation can happen. So that is um, very difficult for many people to digest. And it reflects uh, the kind of like hard feelings that the peace deal has um, brought about uh, within Colombians. Um, I also think that it's very important to mention that, you know, I focus a lot on Mario Montoya, I focus a lot on his career and what he commanded, you know, how the style of commanding, but I also focus a lot on the victims. And I think that is very important um, because it's important to tell both sides of the story. It's, it's important to know that, you know, these victims are desperate for justice. Like they are like one of the victims, her brother was a homeless man, you know, but he was not a guerrilla man. And he was lured by these like allies in the, in the army who eventually took them to the soldiers and they killed him. And she feels that he was killed because he was poor. If this would have been like an upper class Colombian, this would have never happened to him. Um, and so it's very important to, to also reflect what the victims felt because they also felt powerless. He is a very powerful figure. This is absolutely egregious. Like this should have never happened. And it is, it was mainly, it was all the cases happened in households that were really poor. And that is, you know, also a reality that Colombian society grapples with where, you know, the really wealthy have just so much more power and so many privileges that the poor don't have. So, so yes, this is my, Holly, can you go to the last uh, slide? These are the false positives. Um, these are pictures of the false positives. Uh, the tri uh, peace tribunal, which is called uh, the HEP, uh, recently has come out with uh, rulings, not, not, they don't involve Mario Montoya yet. They involve other members of uh, the military, high ranking and high ranking official in particular, um, who accepted their responsibility in this uh, crime. And you know they will pay the sentence that the tribunal asks them to pay. We are still waiting to happen to see what happens uh, with. Uh, we are still waiting to see what happens with Mario Montoya. But you know, the HEP in that ruling wrote a, a report or released a report. And it says that, you know, there's about like a, at least six, they know of about at least 6,000 victims uh, that could have died according to this or under this practice, which was really harrowing. Um, but yeah, so basically it's a story trying of a country trying to grapple with its past trying to understand what is its place in an era of a peace deal that is being implemented and kind of looking back at the at what happened then and how that um, revives political uh, divisions today. So yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, thank you for that fantastic uh, overview. I 
really encourage um, everyone. I put the link in the in the chat to when you have time, please uh, please go read read that fantastic reporting. It's it's so um, it's so um, well rounded and presents um, you know such a complete picture. I think of that era, especially for our trying to understand what was happening at that time. Um, you know, we, we get little glimpses through news reports um, and it's, you know, it's it's difficult to, to, to navigate and understand and your, and your piece just really cut all of that, brings it all together beautifully. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I, I have lots of questions and I'm sure others do. So please, if you have questions, please start putting them into the, uh, the chat. And I'm gonna go ahead and sort of uh, maybe kick it off by, by asking you, um, you know, what was the reception to this story once it was published? Yeah, so I feel like, I feel like it, it because it was published in the Guardian Long Reads, it reached an audience um, outside of Colombia, uh, which for me was very uh, important. And, you know, because this, this, Basically, like there's very little talk about the false positives practice or scandal since it was uncovered. And so to me, it was very important that it kind of revived uh, or uh, like told uh, people about this a horrible scandal. So, and in Colombia, uh, you know, for me, that was kind of the most important thing that a foreign audience could get to talk about Colombia. Because again, I feel like there's not enough attention on Colombia and Colombia is such an interesting country. It is absolutely fascinating. I'm not just saying this because I'm Colombian, by the way. It genuinely, it is a really interesting country and like the most wonderful and egregious things happen. And, you know, it's a country that like, it's just like stories all over the place. And so I think that, you know, it helped, the story definitely helped bring like some interest uh, back into Colombia after it was kind of abandoned by the international media after the signing of the peace deal. So that was very good. And then within Colombia, there was actually a lot of talk as well um, about the peace. And it also like revived uh, sentiments. It also like revived attention around the issue. Um, the victims saw it, you know, the lawyers of the victims saw it. I don't know if Mari Monto just saw it. I assume he did. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, so it was, it was nice to get, like, I feel like it did, uh, revive some reflection about the issue within Colombia and, and yeah, and I got, I got a lot of, um, you know, compliments for a lot of people. I got attacked by other people, like, you know, just like saying that I wasn't being fair that, you know, from both sides actually. Um, but, but yeah, but it, it, it did bring a lot of attention, which I, I'm really thankful for. Yeah, yeah, it certainly did. Um, so, you know, you had amazing, um, you know, background stories with um, the victims' families and what they went through at the site of mass graves and, you know, the emotional trauma. And, um, you know, I just wonder, you know, reporting on such an emotionally charged subject, what was the most difficult or challenging part of that? Um, reporting process for you? So it was very hard to, first of all, hearing these stories is harrowing. It, it really is. I mean, it's not, you know, like how many people actually sit to have a coffee with someone or lunch with someone and they are just telling you how they stood for hours in front of a mass grave, you know, just observing how this team of forensic doctors pull out bodies and bodies that were stacked like potatoes you know that's just like I don't know you, you know it's just not it's just like it isn't okay <laughs> you know and the fact that you know I was like wow this is happening in a middle-income country with solid democratic institutions and you know god knows what happens in a country where you know there are no institutions in Tibet anyway so that was really it was really tough. Also, you, you're not, you know, you're not exposed to this, but also like getting the, the victims to trust me um, was hard. And, you know, and, and I think that I, fortunately, I think I am a very, I have a lot of empathy and, you know, I, I can connect with people a lot. And I feel like for the victims, you know, 
that is important to understand that like my my interest was genuine and like I also made it very clear that you know I'm I'm like I'm not only telling your story I'm telling his story as well you know what I mean and like and they knew you know that I was going to try to interview him and that but so yeah so I was just really transparent with them and I was really patient with them I uh always write letters to uh victims who like I not only for this story but other stories like uh you know I I write to them I call them a lot of them are hesitant to talk you know a lot of them like when I meet them they just take a while to open up so you know it's just like leading like that flow where you're sitting down you're having your coffee you talk to them but you also make sure you know they understand that you're also human and that you know you're here to understand their point of view and and their yeah their grief in a way um so yeah I think the way you approach victims is very important like it's a very special kind of source and you need to be careful with victims of all kinds uh more than any other source I would say because they're very traumatized and you have to be careful not to you know revive that trauma um it's an art I think it's an art I hope I didn't revive any of yeah. my big trauma <laughs> so yeah 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 well yeah thank you for sharing this those, those thoughts um the, so a couple questions from our audience relate to the upcoming elections and you showed a photo that had a, a maybe a future a presidential candidate and and so, so what is, what is the, um, you know, how important are the false positives in the um, Colombian electoral context, in your opinion? Mm. That's a very good question. I don't think it's enough of a salient issue to, for, you know, to, to make it a decisive issue. It's it's not it's not enough of a salient issue for a candidate to latch on to and successfully use it to win the presidency. And I feel that that has to do with two things. Like it's incredible, but like and that I realized also through like my editor's reaction. Cause like he kept asking, like, oh my God, so like how did Colombia react to this? I mean, you know, like what are they? What do they do? Like what? And I'm like, you know, it was a very, and I was trying to explain to him, like, dude, it was just among the upper class, like intellectuals and like the educated, like it was horrible, of course. But most Colombians, you know, they were just so concentrated on how the conflicts impacted them and how the FARC were terrible that they kind of you know, turned a blind eye to it. And, and yeah, so like, you know, I, I quote an anonymous source in there who basically says something like, you know, we had a paramilitarized soul and that basically reflects to the paramilitary groups who were the right-wing groups uh, who like were formed to fight against the FARC because the state was too weak to do it. Um, and I feel like, you know, the FARC was just like common enemy number one and you know that Colombians were so used to that narrative that maybe they didn't understand how serious this other thing that had happened was. And I think that continues to this day. But I also think that peace, the peace deal um, has kind of helped the country focus on other things. And one of these things is like economic development. Uh, which Colombia, in my opinion, has a poor record on, like, you know, Colombia doesn't grow enough to lift millions out of poverty. And I feel like, you know, now that peace at least isn't a part of the day-to-day -day political rhetoric, you know, signing this peace deal and fighting the FARC isn't the main issue, then Colombians have had more time to look at other issues. And what is most pressing for them right now is, you know, their pockets because there's a lot of poverty in Colombia, especially after the pandemic. So yeah, I, I unfortunately don't think, I think, yeah, I think it, I think this issue, I, I do think that it's, it's, uh, it's 
relevant in the sense that the peace tribunal is you know evaluating it and so in that sense it's not like Colombians have completely forgotten about it so yeah unfortunately it's just like you know not going to make it or break it in the in the next election got it got it um you know as an outsider looking in i was always um fascinated with the kind of class dynamics of this very long war and and um there's a good question from uh lily uh in the audience who who, who wanted to know um you know what was the impact of uh the false positives on the indigenous peoples can did you come up so that's a very hard question um I'm not sure, I have to say, I didn't interview any victims who were uh, related to a false positive uh, uh, victim that was uh, an indigenous member, a part of an indigenous group. Uh, that being said, if I remember well, I don't, I don't want to completely say, because I, I don't want to, I mean, you can't quote me on this because I, I'm not 100% sure, but, you know, I wouldn't uh, be surprised considering that according to the peace deal, there's like at least 6,000 people who were killed in this fashion that, you know, one of them was in some shape or form linked to an indigenous uh, group. That's very possible. You know, and like it's it's yeah, and it's also like true that like members of indigenous groups, as especially the young members, like they tend to go, you know, uh, everywhere. They tend to move um, uh, outside of their home uh, or their indigenous reserve, for example, for various reasons. Um, but but yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint you uh, on that, but I cannot uh, <laughs> answer your question. We yeah, we appreciate your answer. We appreciate it. Um, I'm kind of curious in all your research, did you ever find a thread or, or get a sense for where the military um, leaders came up with this body count plan or the training that carry out these kind of operations? So I think that, you know, the, the what happened as well, like at least a lot of my sources, what they said was like, look, we were pressured to report a high body count. Like it was mad, the pressure was mad. And they, you know, it was, it was an unreasonable kind of pressure. And it was so unreasonable that it led them to this, like, some sources say, for example, some people say that Montoya directly asked, you know, I, I want to see rivers of blood. Like, why am I not seeing rivers of blood? What is going on? I honestly think that, <laughs> look, things are not black and white. And you cannot say it's just, it's one thing, it's one person, it's one, you know, it was a combination of things. And I have to say that some of them, you know, people just didn't think about the consequences of what this was going to bring. You know what I mean? You, you just, because Colombia was just so focused on war and when you're, you know, war is dirty. It's like things like, you know, this kind of thing happens. Like, you know, this happened all the way back to Alexander the Great. And like, I'm not sure if you've heard the story of Alexander the Great, like, um, you know, the, the, the warriors were kind of respected because they had ears, like necklaces of ears that, of the people that they had killed. And, you know, because that's like, oh my God, he's killed so many opponents in war. That's awesome. But what they were actually doing was killing innocent people so that they could, or like chopping people's ears, you know, who had like, not just to like show off. So, yeah. you know what I mean? It's and this kind of some thing. Of, some of us older Americans, uh, the body count thing reminds us of Vietnam. There were exactly, some, exactly. Yeah. There were, I remember looking into a bunch of cases in Vietnam, exactly. So, you know, it's just like, I think that people who make public policy like need to be more careful. <laughs> and this is in all areas of life, like not only like military policy, but like public policy can go wrong in so many ways. So you need to be very, very careful in how you design it. And, you know, I just think this is a case where it's just like 
gone wrong really really wrong so yeah hmm. I'd like to shift to a few more kind of tips maybe for, for other journalists. Uh, you spent a year, immense amount of research. Um, you know, how much did you leave out? Um, how did you decide what to what to cut? A lot. <laughs> so I left out a lot. Um, as I said, like I've lost count of how many people I talked to uh, for this story. And like I left out a lot of victims uh accounts and stories that you know I wish could have made it in there but you know it, it's also about making the story coherent so that readers could understand because that's also an important part of it like if you don't tell a coherent story if you tell a very convoluted story with all of your sources accounts in there and nobody's going to read it and that's actually worse for the story you know and so I have to say like, so what got left out was like also largely uh, a decision that my editors took, <laughs> which I'm really glad they did because, um, you know, it was hard for me to like also, also say this needs to be taken out, this doesn't need to be taken out. But I must also say that as you're writing, you kind of think of the narratives and the things that will tie your story together. And those things that don't tie your story together even though they're very important, will often get left out. And, and that's really important to know. Like sometimes, you know, when you're when you're writing that story and you feel like you're adding it in there, just this part, you're just adding this part of the story in there just because you want to mention it, but it feels like, you know, it's not, doesn't need to be in there. That's it's probably because it doesn't need to be in there. Or you can put it in there in a more concise manner. Um, and so, so yeah, that's, it's, it's very hard because again, I want to tell everyone's story and there's so much, you know, about Montoya that I also thought was very important to tell and like, but you know, but you can't add anything and lean on your editors because <laughs> they are, everybody needs an editor. Everybody needs an yeah. editor. <laughs> so, and, and they will help you. Don't be afraid to let, don't be afraid to let go of those little sections that you fell in love with. Yeah, and maybe they exactly. don't really need to be in there. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. We got, let's see. We got a question from Gabriella. Um, this goes back to um, you know what we we're discussing earlier about the military and kind of how people related to the conflict. Um, the question is why are there so many um, guys ready to join the army in Colombia? They have to face so much pressure, and uh, in this some cases commit crimes. Um, is it for economic reasons? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, I'm not sure there's an immense amount, like I'm not sure all young Colombians are like eager to join the army um, in, in Colombia, but, you know, I will say there's a, there's a lot of people who uh, join the army precisely because of economic reasons, you know, there's kind of two streams of military training in Colombia. Um, so there's a professional uh, stream and then there's the non-professional stream. And so like in one stream, you have like the highly educated individuals who make it all the way to being a general. And then you have the other stream where you just get to be a soldier and you don't have the possibility to, you know, go, up the ranks as much as you would, or there's actually very rare cases in which you would uh, jump to be a general. And so, yeah, many people end up becoming soldiers because they, you know, lack economic opportunity and because they need their families. And in the end, like, you know, the army does offer you some perks that are very interesting. Like they not only feed you, they not, but they give you a pension, they give you you know, they, they give you certain perks. That being said, it must be really scary to be in the army, right? Because like, I have to say, th this is how the story is also gray. Being a soldier in Colombia must be among the most horrible things that you can live through, especially if you're sent to fight off the, these guerrillas. And also for the guerrillas, it must be one of the most terrible things to actually be sent to fight with the army. You know what I mean? It's just like, like you have to understand them from both points of view. It's just like a terrible prospect for both of these people. And so, so yeah, I think 
you know, to answer your question, I think that, that yeah, money definitely does captivate uh, some people into joining the army. But, you know, so there's some other people that join for different reasons, especially the ones who go through uh, the whole career where they eventually can become generals. Like they, they've got a real devotion for the army. And yeah, and it's like a culture, which is, you know, makes it what it is, makes the institution what it is. Gabriella, thank you for that answer. And um, I want to jump back to the nuts and bolts of journalism, freelancing. Um, you, you know, be before you could write that and do that amazing story, I assume you were already into it, but um, you had to pitch it. What was it like trying to get newsrooms or news publishers interested in this story? How did you? Yeah, so pitching is really tough, <laughs> especially when, you know, nobody knows who you are <laughs> and when, you know, you've got very few uh, bylines or when your portfolio of published stuff is, is, is limited, which was my case. Um, but I think that, you know, for this story in particular, what helped a lot was again the Pulitzer grant because my you know the editors didn't have to pay for anything like I paid for all the expenses related to reporting this story with the Pulitzer Center grant so you know say like and, and that goes true for the other stories that I published thanks to uh, the grant like I also went to Putumayo which you know is expensive to go to because it's very remote and like I had to stay there and yeah, just flying out there and then coming back. And then I had to hire like a taxi driver who like left me out in the middle of nowhere. And like, anyway, you have to pay for all these things. And when, <laughs> and when like, and when you come to an editor and you say, you know, I'm going down to Putumayo and I'm gonna, you know, spend a year talking to all these victims and you don't have to pay for anything. And they're like, okay. <laughs> You know, it just makes it easier for them to commission that story. Um, yeah, that being said, it's, you know, editors get so many pitches um, and they're often bombarded with stories that you just have to make sure that your story is a good story. And you just have to make sure that you pitch a story that is very aligned with the publication and because if you don't then you know it's just they're not going to bite and i think like you know the guardian really cares about issues like these like the like human rights issues and justice issues and that's you know this was a great story for them it was a very very good story like i thought that it it, it and this is also i knew because they also like I, I read the guardian um because i i've seen some of the long form uh journalism and, and I knew you know this was like a story that could be told uh through through them but also like I think that the pitch that I sent to them you know because like you could do the fall you could you could do a false positives related story in so many ways but I did my homework you know and I knew how I was going to tell the story in a way that would fit them or at least I tried to and I guess it worked <laughs> because it got published. Um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I mean, is it clear? I mean, is that, it's very hard. It's very hard, but you yep. don't feel disheartened. Like, just pitch away. And, you know, statistically, someone's going to have to bite. <laughs> yeah. And, when they do, and you may get a lot of rejections, but you have to keep going. Exactly. And, yeah. Exactly. I loved your um, comment about, you know, making sure that you tailor your pitch to the outlet, understand the the audience of that particular publisher is, is really key. Um, so, you know, one one question, uh, another question I have is, is related to um, safety and security. Um, mm -hmm. So during all of this reporting and in the aftermath of the publication, did you have any safety concerns either for yourself or for the, the people who are your sources um, for this uh, project? So I did have a concern about my sources, definitely, because many of them are being targeted. Um, and I was concerned that they were gonna be targeted 
even more because like many of them have had i mean assassins kind of like going after them in their car and i talk about one of these uh attacks in in the piece and so i was very concerned about them but you know we talked about it with the lawyers and we talked about it with them uh and also that's you know, that's also one of the issues for why I chose one of the victims, because, you know, she's kind of very vocal uh, about this whole issue and about her activism around this issue. And lucky for me, she's fearless in a sense. Um, so, you know, she's protected. I also knew she's, you know, she's got government protection. Like the government has given her protection precisely because they've tried to kill her. And, and so, you know, for me, I'm not sure if it would have been the same if she weren't protected. Like, if she weren't protected, I would have probably hit her name. I would have probably chosen a different name because she can be killed. Like, if she doesn't, you know, m go through the streets in a armored vehicle, then I probably would have considered changing her name. So it was mostly a concern for, for them. For me, not so much. I actually have to say, but I think that also has to do with the fact that like, I'm not trying to like get myself out there all the time. You know what I mean? And I think that's very important for journalists to do. I think that, you know, this is one of the criticisms that I have for the journalism field. I feel like the journalism field is attracting too many people wanting to be like the next Anderson Cooper or whatever it is. And like they're all for stardom. The gonzo, gonzo journalist. And that's a mistake. Like, you know, I think like I heard someone the other say the other day say something that I think is like a motto that is incredible and I, that I, you know, stick to. And she said something like you have to strive for low ego and high delivery. And that's exactly what I think journalists should do. Like, don't look for stardom. Don't put yourself out there. Because if you do, one of the things that will happen is that, you know, you're more visible. And, you know, people will, you know, come looking for you or whatever. So, like, you know, it's, it's not, the more you stick to that kind of thing, the less exposed you are to being targeted, you know, just maintain a low profile. Sure, you have a byline, but you know, you don't have to like, I don't know, just, yeah, I guess be humble. Yeah, no, that's, yeah. That's wise, wise advice. I'm just wondering as you sort of think about where we are as a free, where, where freelancers are today in, in reporting, how much, uh, how important do you think is, is digital security and safety in your reporting practices? I think it's very important. I think it's incredibly important. May, probably that's like the biggest threat uh, for journalists nowadays, you know what I mean? So I, I do take steps to, to you know, protect myself. Um, I use proton mail. <laughs> Uh, a bit of propaganda here for proton mail, but I do use proton yeah. mail. Encrypted, encrypted mail. Yeah. Exactly. Encrypted mail. And then um look, sometimes I'll even like leave my phone behind when I go and interview a source. Because you never know if yeah, and like it's funny because like Pegasus may be listening. Yeah, what if someone's listening? Like, I mean, I I don't know. It's like to me, it's just like, oh my God, come on, nobody's gonna be listening to me. But like in Colombia, there was like a certain moment where like every journalist thought their, their phone was tapped for some reason. Like, and so like, just leave your phone behind, you know, take notes, um, use encrypted mail, uh, use telegraph or signal. And, and yeah, you know, that's, that's what I try, I try to use. Um, and yeah, just, yeah, those tools are very, are very important. More, more, more sage advice. Appreciate yeah. that. Um, <laughs> curious, um, you know, I, I did some googling, looking up the uh, the general to to see what is going on with this court case. Um, do you have any updates on that front? Do you keep up with that at all? 
so we're still waiting to see what will happen uh, with him. It's like, so understanding the peace tribunal, it's very hard because it doesn't work like any other justice system in the world. It's a very unique justice uh, system. And so basically what happens is uh, you can go through like the fast stream where, you know, if you've committed a crime during the conflict, a crime against humanity or war crime, you go in there, you accept responsibility and you commit yourself to telling the whole truth. And in exchange, you don't get sent to prison, but you get some sort of sentence that is, you know, a, can be a very creative sentence, which, you know, might range from like, oh, you're going to help uh, the this municipality rebuild the school that you destroyed back in, you know, that kind of sentence. And so Montoya's case is being considered right now is being evaluated by the Peace Tribunal, uh, but we don't know right now what kind of sentence there will be. Montoya has denied that he had anything to do with the false, but he has denied any knowledge. And in fact, prosecutors don't really, you know, believe he like ordered people to, you know, go, you need to kill them and dress them up in guerrilla fatigues and declare they were uh, guerrilla members killed in combat. Like that, the prosecutors actually never uh, made a case for that. What they said is like, he should have known, you know, the, the, according to, international humanitarian law he should have known that this practice was going on because of his high ranking status and he should have stopped it and so it's now up to you know this uh case to be proven at uh, the peace tribunal and so we're still waiting for you know a sentence or whatever comes like they usually call them autos which basically say you know what the first instance of this peace tribunal has found. And we're still waiting for that in like Montoya's case and like to see how he, you know, what 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 was his role in the false positives case. But we have um, seen other reports um, by the peace tribunal that have said that other uh, members of the military were responsible for this uh, crime in a way they accepted responsibility and there's at least one other high ranking like a general uh, in there which is very important because you know it's the first time that this has happened uh, in, in the history of Colombia like the ordinary justice system was investigating this for the longest time they never you know they never found a high ranking official uh, who's guilty like they never actually indicted someone on that so so it's interesting that the PCL has come to this uh, point and we're still waiting to see what will happen with uh, Montoya, but yeah. Interesting indeed, and a cliffhanger. Probably uh, ready for some follow-up reporting. Um, yeah. Ariana, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, your reporting is incredible. It's amazing work. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. And I thank you for your time. Um, thank you. Our audience <laughs> thanks you. Um, and the Pulitzer Center thanks you too. Thank you. Um, I let, let everybody know that uh, this uh, recording uh, of this conversation will be online at PulitzerCenter.org in the coming days. So please feel free to share. I'd like to thank my colleagues at the Pulitzer Center, especially Holly Rosewood, our producer for this session. Thank you, Holly. Uh, we appreciate, appreciate all of you in the audience for joining us today. And uh, for those of you who are able, please consider making a a donation, becoming a Pulitzer Center champion, and supporting our work. Um, please also join us for uh, future virtual events. Um, and I'd like to make one more plug for the Breakthrough Journalism Award. If you are an early or mid-career uh, uh, journalist and a former Pulitzer Center grantee, please consider applying for the Breakthrough Journalism Award. The deadline is March 1st. The project that you submit or the reporting you submit does not have to be a Pulitzer Center funded projects. So it just has to have happened in the past year. So you can check out all the guidelines and everything on our, our site, but we hope you do apply. Um, a big thanks again to Ava Laura for her support for this. Uh, and uh, we encourage you, if you want to learn more about the Pulitzer Center, to visit our website at PulitzerCenter.org. Um, please stay with us a bit longer after we officially end this today to take a brief survey. We'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, thank you for joining us and goodbye for now.